We've had a, a long and very intense day, so I promise you I will be brief, and you'll all be thoroughly glad to hear that. Um, just a number of things first. Um, thanks, and a very small amount of housekeeping. So I'll do the housekeeping first. First of all, we've just said, as a reception as soon as we're finished. A number of people have said to me that there's been very little time for question and answer after the uh, papers have been delivered. I think it's all the more important that if you do have the time, you can be at the reception because so will the speakers be and you can maybe carry through some of the points that you would have liked to have made or questions you would have liked to have asked. The opportunity will be there. The other thing is this. For everybody who has a car, who parked their car in the multi-storey car park just over the way, you can buy a ticket for four euros in the cafe on the ground floor, which will pay for your day's car parking. I think that's a very important point indeed. So, by way of that, just to th give thanks. Um, first of all, to the Institute uh, for International Conflict Resolution and Reconstruction, and particularly its director, John Doyle. John Doyle has given us great support from the very beginning, and we really do have to thank him for that. I particularly also would like to thank pe people who were involved in actually uh, the details of getting this event into place from DCU. Walt Kilroy, Sissoka for the preparation work, and I'd also like to thank the voluntary student helpers who worked today. Next, the very obvious thing, I would like to thank the speakers, because without their time and thought and their presence, and their emotional energy in writing a paper and delivering a paper, this wouldn't exist. This isn't a cliche, thanking the speakers. They were centrally important to today. Of the speakers, I'd also like to thank Edward Domin and Michael Pugh, both of whom had to travel from outside Ireland to be here. So if you could just give your thanks to them. Next, I'd like to thank everybody who were acted as chair for each of the sessions. Their work has been very important and it's often ignored. Somebody who chairs a session well gives the session flow and continuity and sense. So we have to thank them also. Also to thank the staff of the Helix for their work on the all of the uh, coffee and our lunch break, that it ran so smoothly and so well. And to the people who worked on the plugging in bits and pieces to computers, uh, because I would have to say I was living in a state of paralyzed fear in case I had to do that. And again, the next point is not a cliche. I have to thank you. You gave of your time when you had plenty of other things that you could have been doing. And your engagement with the speakers has been quite enormous. So I have to thank you, and I must thank you, and I gladly thank you. Finally, um, I want to thank my colleague, Martin uh, Levis, for his help. Not just his help, but for the enormous amount of work which he put into this event. So my thanks to you. Um, I've done the reception and I've done the Euro, uh, Euro tickets for your cars. This leaves me with, um, very, very briefly, how do I sum up today? For me, today summed up by helping me to focus, not just on questions which had occurred to me and giving them better focus, but in a number of instances, in questions being asked which simply hadn't occurred to me 
And I do have to say on a number of occasions I was quite ashamed of myself. They should have occurred to me, but they never did. And that's important because it's continuing one of the central points of peacemaking, which is that it is a process. It doesn't come to an end. It's a very difficult process. We've heard that frequently today, a very complex process. And it's a process which moves from, if you like, peacemaking by an individual within an individual to peacemaking between people, um, between groups, between countries, alliances, all of that. It raises another question. Does anybody own peacemaking? Do the NGOs? Do Quakers? We have a wee bit of a kind of uh, arrogance at times. Oh, we're Quakers, we do peace. <laughs> With the implication that the others, well, they don't really do it properly. We need to be a little bit more humble, as does everybody who's engaged with peace. We think we operate on a moral high ground, and we need to be careful about that arrogance, because it can cloud our judgment and thinking. How does peacemaking function? It's a concept, and in many cases it's a belief. But it's one of those interesting things that we've been observing all through today, that it combines concept and realpolitik. What uh, the founder of Quakerism meant by the peace testimony at heart still is there. But he responded to the reality of the situation in which he lived. The reality in which, of the situation in which we live is a very different one. It contains things which elements, political elements and structures, which I doubt occurred to him. Why should they have? I agree with some of the fact that some speakers at one, one point or another touched on the dispiriting nature of peacemaking. If we look at the last 10 years, what's been happening? all over the Near and Middle East, the Far East, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, South Mediterranean countries. You can go on and on. Mayhem. And that is dispiriting. One of the things that has occurred to me, and I'll be come to an end very briefly, is a number of things, a number of words one is common, commonality of interest, not political necessarily, but how that commonality can maintain its integrity at the same time as respecting the diverse modes of thought which contribute to that commonality in a way which will not erode the integrity of the diversity. That's a complex matter, and it's one we're having to deal with more and more as we deal with international structures, the concept of international practice. I was just thinking about this as we were going through today because I knew I was going to have to do this summing up. And I thought, well, if you look at peacemaking in terms of the last 10 years, you'll probably end up thinking, well, by the time this, this session is finished, probably the best thing I could do would be to go out, find a concrete breeze wall and bang my head against it. If you look at it in the longer term, it becomes somewhat more bearable. If we go back 1,500 years to Augustine's concept of the just war. The concept of a just more war now may be rapidly losing its conceptual validity. But Augustine had to combine the idea of a war 
which would occur under certain given terms of reference to be a just war and a war which was not a just war. He was constructing that at a time of absolute total political and military chaos in Western Europe in the early 500s AD. And that was what he was responding to. Unfortunately, as a species, we tend to say, right, it's called just war. That's what it says, so it's not going to change. We don't develop our thinking. We have a bad habit of not doing that. But if we go further on, we talked to um, what uh, we heard this morning about Calvin and Calvin's thinking. That's quite extraordinary and a quite extraordinary development of perceptions. We go to Guillaume-Henri Dufour and his most extraordinary generalship. Dufour who then went on to be one of the founders of the Red Cross. The Red Cross as I suppose a certain degree a benchmark in thinking about the possibilities of peace and peaceful action and peace related action at other than a simply very local level. We move into the international definitions of war conduct. They may not always be observed, but they do exist. And that's the important factor. Related to conduct of war, treatment of civilians, types of weaponry that is even within the mayhem of war are more bad than others. We move on to the very concept of something like the United Nations, which is quite extraordinary if you actually think about it and the time that it was set up and the fact that it is still functioning. Think about the international courts of law. They're all criticized because they're very, at times, messy in how they go about their business. But it is necessary to think that those are very new concepts for a human species to come to terms with. They didn't exist previously. It's a gigantic change for people and countries to say, well, we're not simply doing bilateral stuff. We're doing multilateral stuff and international stuff. That's a huge change. It will probably take another century for it to be fully bedded in. And that brings in one other thing, the emotional nature of the human species. Why is war so attractive? Why can it be made so charming? Why can it be made so desirable? We need to think about that. We also need to think, and this is my final point, and this is a point which has been made by a number of speakers, either directly or somewhat indirectly. Without going into cliche territory, Everybody in this room has a responsibility as an individual and as a group to push the idea of peace and peace-related action as a realistic alternative to military action. We look at the European Union. It ran for 65 years without a military force. It's now militarizing. We're now operating in uh, a scenario in which the uh, politics and militarization are moving rapidly to the right. That's radically changed, certainly, the uh, political and moral and ethical scenario in which I came to adulthood and which I assumed up until the last 10 or 15 or 20 years was what was happening. My assumptions have gone, and I have to rethink my assumptions. They aren't there any longer. That takes me back to where I started from. Today has been something which has pushed questions into my face, which I can no longer avoid. And I thank our speakers, and I thank you in the audience for that. 
I want to end up with one short sentence, two short sentences, uh, which John Doyle may said this morning in his introduction. In terms of peacemaking, what have we learned? What are we learning? I leave that question with you. <laughs>